I want to emphasize the point that you were making in the beginning, which is that this is all probably a recent thing for humans. Once you start storing or growing and then storing grain is when humans get exposed to mold toxins in the food system in a much higher percentage than we were as hunter gatherers. I'll tell you what, the Hadza, I say this on so many podcasts, but it's an important point to always repeat. They get up, they hunt, they eat the food, it's gone. It's in their belly. The longest they're keeping food around is maybe three or four days if they have a massive kill and they're going to ferment uh, maybe a few pieces of meat or dry it, making jerky. But they're, they're not holding any plant foods. They're certainly not storing any grains. Uh, I think that their exposure to fungus would have been much lower. But as we know, there was this thing called the Neolithic Revolution 10 to 15,000 years ago. It's not really a revolution. It was more like a de-evolution, the Neolithic devolution, where for some reason we started growing grains and pastoralism came in. Jared Diamond has famously called this the worst mistake in human history. And I think it's in the running. I think there's a lot of horrible things that have happened in human history that are major mistakes, but certainly the advent of what he calls the cult of the seed was a big one for many reasons. You touched on one of them, lectins, defense chemicals, and these grains, which are seeds that clearly don't want to get eaten, but mold toxins associated with this being a big, big part of this as well. So this is not a new problem for humans. Now, Let's let's move on to a little bit of a rehash of something we might've talked about in the first episode, but let's talk about where humans can get exposed to mold toxins. We've touched on this a little bit with grains. Let's come back to that. I know nuts and seeds can be an issue. Anything basically stored and dried, even dried fruit can be an issue, but let's talk about other sources of mold exposure. Most people will probably be aware of this. We've done a couple of other things since the Neolithic devolution, specifically living in houses made of paper, um, which can be a problem. So where are people getting exposed to mold? Yeah, in Austin, you know, it's like one of the mold capitals. I mean, I've seen so many clients in Austin, and I don't know why. I mean, Portland, Oregon is no different. Seattle's no different in terms of the moisture level and the rain. But I think what makes Austin uniquely moldy is because there's so much heat and humidity versus in Portland, it's a lot cooler, right? So there's certain molds that are going to grow more in warm, humid places like tropical molds. And then you have things that are going to grow in cooler climates. And I watched back our podcast we did first. And I said, you and I were talking about, well, where is it coming from? And I said, well, 90% is moldy buildings, water damaged buildings that people are in, whether it's an office building that you're working in, whether it's a school building that your children is attending school in, or whether it's your home. And a lot of people got sick in the past two years because of the pandemic. They've been at home and they're working at their home offices now. And people are realizing, wait a second, I don't feel as good as I did at the office. And commercial buildings generally are better in terms of airflow. They generally use less toxic materials because they're more, uh, I would just say basic, like they're warehouses. And you just fill this warehouse in and turn it into an office building where a home You've got kitchen cabinets that could be off-gassing. You've got floor chemicals. You've got drywall. You've got, um, like, just think of a general commercial building like a Chipotle, for example. Chipotle is relatively a mold-free building. You go in those places, they have concrete floors. They have very minimalist decor. They have stainless steel tables. They have huge windows. There's not really much for mold to grow on in a Chipotle. So that's like a mold-safe building if you want to eat out. But in your home, there's just so much more material, like your bathroom vanity. You've got a lot more indoor plumbing involved compared to your office building. Maybe your office building has a bathroom, but you don't have a kitchen sink and a dishwasher and a bar and a a basement bathroom and a sump pump that can fail. And so indoor mold from a home is still probably the biggest source. But when I was doing research for this podcast, I actually found a study that tried to quantify this. And they were looking at specifically okra toxin. Now, you and I looked at a couple of case studies last time, and we looked at okra toxin, which is probably the most common mycotoxin that we're going to see. And this is produced by the molds aspergillus and penicillium. And they actually quantified this, which is pretty interesting. So they talk about the, the sources here. So like inhalation, right? So that would be a water damaged building, dermal contact, and then various foods. So then they go into maize or corn. So sorghum, wheat, rice, barley, rye, bread, oats, flour, pasta, grapes, infant cereals, apples, peaches, strawberries, pears, oranges, figs, mangoes, wine, tomatoes, coffee beans, watermelons, nuts, rapeseed, sesame, spice, soybeans, cocoa, peanuts, chickpeas, milk, and milk-based extra blah, blah, blah. Egg, cheese, yam, potatoes, garlic, fish, pork, poultry, jerky, dried beans. If you look at what you're eating and what 
you and I are promoting people to eat, we're cutting out like probably 90% of this. And I don't know too much about the watermelon. I, I don't really eat that much watermelon. I don't eat too many pears. If I do eat strawberries, they're fresh and I make sure that they're not moldy. But what they found is 44%, here it is, the European Commission report estimates adult exposure to ochre toxin is as follows. They say 44% of their exposure is cereal, 10% wine, 9% coffee, 7% beer, 5% 5 5 cacao, and then you're down at 3% meat, 3% spices, and 15 others. So if you're going carnivore-ish, let's just say you're doing meat. Maybe you're getting a tiny 3% of that ochre toxin exposure from meat. And let's say maybe you do a little extra than Paul. I know you do salt. Maybe you're wanting to go a little crazy and go garlic or some basil. Maybe you get a little extra there. But just imagine how much less people would get exposed to. And I want to make the point that in a developed country where we have access to good quality meats, we could easily tweak our diet. But a lot of these publications are looking at India and these other very, very uh, poor countries where grains are the staple of the diet, rice and corn and, and seeds and sorghum and all this stuff. These are like the staple foods. And so that's the really concerning part is people who may never even find this podcast, those are the people that are most affected by this because the staple foods in these countries are the most contaminated foods. And so for us listening to this, we're easily able to just go, I'm done with grain and we can cut it out. But you know, the people that may not ever find this, those are the ones that are being affected the most.